Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Evans. I'm the Chief Executive of the Learning and Work Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you all here this morning um, to the Housing, Learning and Work Conference, uh, which we run jointly with uh, Communities That Work. And it's absolutely fantastic um, that we've got, uh, I think, more than 570 people um, signed up for today's event, which shows the the level of interest um, in the topics we're going to uh, cover off uh, this morning. Um, and of course, we wouldn't be able to have this event or to have so many of you um, here virtually um, talking about um, learning, work and, and housing um, if it wasn't for our sponsors. So I would like to say a huge thank you to Abri, to Clarion Futures and to Sovereign. Um, we wouldn't be able to put on this event uh, without your support. So we're incredibly uh, grateful for it. So, so thank you um, to them for their help and support. Um, now, this event is being recorded, so I just wanted to, to let everybody uh, know that that's the case. Um, um, so uh, just, just as you would expect, given we're sort of broadcasting um, uh, this event uh, live as well. Um, now, uh, Lindsay, I'll hand over to you shortly and will take us through some of uh, the other housekeeping and some of the other introductions to the event and some of the issues we're going to cover. Uh, but I just wanted to say a couple of words about where we are overall and um, the sorts of uh, topics we're going to talk about today and where they sit in that bigger picture. So um, I think when we had this conference uh, roughly this time last year, um, it looks like um, Unemployment had certainly peaked lower than we'd feared earlier in the pandemic. We'd have avoided that unemployment catastrophe, but unemployment was still, you know, pretty high, pretty elevated. We were in the middle of uh, uh, lockdown three, I think, um, and um, the furlough scheme was still in operation. Lots of uncertainty ahead. Now you fast forward a year, um, and the labour market has done surprisingly well, given um, the effects of the pandemic and lots of other things going on at the same time as well. Um, employment is rising, um, unemployment is down. Um, so there are lots of positives there. Um, but before you all um, head off to celebrate mission accomplished, um, I think there's three really big issues that we, we need to focus on and need to tackle. And we're gonna try and cover as much of that today as we can. So the first is the missing worker challenge. So there's 1.1 million fewer people in the labour market than if pre-pandemic trends had continued. Um, and this helps to explain why it's actually, it's, to a degree, bad news that we've got record vacancies. We've got about 1.3 million vacancies. Generally, that's good news because it means employers are recruiting. But in part, at the moment, it's bad news because employers are struggling to fill those jobs. And the reason they're struggling to fill those jobs is because of those 1.1 million missing workers. Some of that is reduced net migration. Um, some of it is young people, uh, more young people staying in education, which assuming it's high quality education is a good thing. Um, but actually the biggest chunk of it probably is older people dropping out of the labour market and particularly those with um, long term conditions and health problems. Now, actually, local government and um, housing, social housing providers are really well placed to engage that group, I think, and in contact with many in that group as well. So one of the things we'd like to talk about today is how can uh, housing providers and local government and other local partners work together to engage that group and get people back into the labour market where, where they want to work. Um, second challenge is about um, good work and the cost of living. So um, uh, we're definitely in the middle of a cost of living uh, crisis. Real wages fell for the last quarter of 2021. And then we've got ri further rises in energy prices and um, national insurance prices to come and, and things like that. So how do we how do we deal with the cost of living that's affecting many social housing tenants, for example, I know lots of you will be um, seeing seeing lots, lots of that. So how can we support um, social housing tenants and all of those on uh, low incomes um, to deal with that cost of living um, crisis? Um, but also, you know, before the pandemic, we were talking a lot about the quality of work as well as how many people are in work. It feels like that's kind of uh, rising to the fore again. So how do we promote good work uh, for everybody, work with opportunities to progress and develop, um, as well as uh, good paying, good working conditions as well. Um, and then the third challenge, I think, is how do we um, narrow inequalities between groups and areas? Now, 
the, the latest nomenclature for that is about leveling up. And we've had the leveling up uh, white paper recently. Um, and um, um, it's a long standing uh, challenge, I think, actually, as, as uh, most of you will, lots of you will have been working on this for, for many, many years. In, in fact, um, I might ask the, 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 the learning and work team if they could pop into the chat box um, some details on a, a leveling up index that we published um, a few weeks back. Um, and what was interesting, one of the interesting things on that is that many of the areas that look like they, they need leveling up, um, that are sort of behind the UK average on things like employment and pay and stuff like that. Um, they're, they're some of the same areas that were um, targeted by the 1934 Special Areas Act. That's a niche reference for half past nine in the morning. But that was the, the government at the time trying to put extra support into areas of high unemployment. So these are not new challenges. Um, we know something about what works, but actually it's also pretty tough, otherwise we'd have done it by now. Um, so how can how can we reduce those inequalities between groups and areas and, and how can levelling up help? And of course, the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is a really key part of that, the successor to European Social Funds. Uh, we've had some more details um, around that. It's a relatively light touch. I know we're expecting um, frameworks with some more details that we'll talk about um, today. I find it somewhat baffling that it seems like the government's going to wait until 24, 25 for the people and skills elements of that to start. That risks a real sort of gap, a chasm in support between ESF ending and SPF um, starting. So uh, what can we do to, to bridge some of that gap and what should Shared Prosperity Fund look like? How does it help uh, the people in the most need? How does it, what's the role of social housing within that? Uh, how, how do we narrow those inequalities between groups? So that's three pretty big um, challenges to try and solve in three hours. Um, so we might not quite get all the way through all of that, but those are some of the issues we're going to be covering. And the context, of course, of an aging population, longer working lives, pressure on the public finances and transition to net zero. We'll be talking about green jobs later, for example, in that context. So there's a lot going on. Um, we probably thought things would have been a lot worse a couple of years ago when the pandemic started and we should celebrate that success and I think the government's plan for jobs and things like the furlough scheme have made such a huge um, difference but we've got lots more to do and particularly to make sure that those who have too often missed out don't miss out in the future um, and hence, um, hence the levelling up mission. So that's what I wanted to say by way of introduction and kind of scene setting um, if you like. Now I mentioned that we're um, delighted to be uh, running this conference along with um, communities that work and we do lots of lots of work together on on these sorts of issues and and it's a great partnership and we look forward to continuing um, to work uh, together and with other partners as well and so to um, chair this first part of the conference I'm going to pass over to Lindsay Sweeney who's the managing director of communities that work so good morning Lindsay and over to you. Morning Stephen, uh, really nice to see you here and to know that how many people there are um, registered and, uh, and with us this morning throughout the, the conference morning. So um, uh, thank you for that introduction. That's a brilliant overview of those three key areas to consider uh, as, we, as we sit here today at this point in time for this conference um, and plenty to cover through the agenda this morning. Um, in a moment, I have the great pleasure of, um, of introducing uh, Councillor Kevin Bentley. Um, and just before that, I'll do some um, quick housekeeping. And I suppose the, the view from communities that work. Um, so in brief, um, you should all have an interactive programme. Um, I'm old fashioned and have a nice paper copy, but um, it is interactive. So please refer to it through the morning, have it um, uh, on screen. Um, it's got buttons you can press to join sessions, including the breakout sessions. It has all the hashtags that you need um, for the conference. Please feel free to use your social media channels to comment, pose questions and, and give a commentary on the uh, conference as we go through uh, and refer to that program for, for where we are in the morning and where you need to be for your breakout sessions and, and where the break uh, times are. Um, we're using Slido. Um, there'll be um, some interactive parts to this. We'll have a couple of polls through the morning. So we will at least get a bit of a chance to hear from you in, in summary. Um, and there is, of course, the opportunity to pose questions throughout the morning. Please use your Slido uh, chat box for that. And our uh, technical conveners at Learning and Work Institute will be monitoring that and pushing questions through to me and to the other chairs throughout the morning. So please interact with us as much as you can. And um, 
accept our apologies that we can't have uh, 575 people on camera um, and to sort of get that sense of everyone who's here. But but thank you for joining us. And, and I would like to echo Stephen's thanks to our sponsors as well, who do make these events possible. Um, a really, uh, really brief look back. These are annual conferences and they always make me think about the previous ones. So um, this is the biggest conference we've run with the Learning and Work Institute. Of course, being online helps to make that more accessible, um, but we've beaten our record from last year as well. So I think it's clear that this is a key time for, of, of course, the levelling up agenda um, and dealing with uh, social inequity that, that Stephen's mentioned there, going way back into, um, into the, the annals of parliamentary interests. Um, but also uh, we're, we're bet betwixt and between two points now. We have the levelling up white paper, we don't yet have the full UK SPF prospectus, which of course is the social fund, which is going to replace European social funding, which many of us um, as professionals and, and individuals will be familiar with over the decades um, of our lives and working lives since up to now. Um, so we're really at that change point for, for this country and um, for the way in which we use and, and uh, monitor our social funding and our social spend. So um, we've, we've got record numbers of people today, but some of the themes that, that will come through, I'm sure um, will resonate. We, in previous years, we heard from Matthew Taylor talking about um, ABC, the Any Job, Better Job Career. That whole notion has come around again with the DWP. We've heard from ministers in uh, previous um, conferences. And today the real focus um, is on place and, and localism and devolution and how do we work within those local structures? We've always talked about that in previous conferences, but this year it really feels front and centre. Um, and there's no better ground, uh, there's no better territory for social housing to operate in than localities, than neighbourhoods and local spaces, regions, towns and places that make sense and which we all live and operate in. So I'm, I'm really, gl really glad that our, our keynote address comes from uh, the leader of a local council and the local government association, that joint role. Um, so I, I just can't think of any better place to begin this conference because as a from within the housing sector, I know that we're going to need to forge really in, enduring partnerships with local authorities. It's always been important, but it's never more important than now. And I'm really keen to understand how we advance that. So at Communities at Work, um, we are a front and centre of that with our members. We're calling for that um, in the um, involvement of social housing in the forthcoming local investment plans for UK SPF. And we um, are, are really keen to continue working with the local government association through Councillor Kevin Bentley and many other colleagues to try and forge those lasting links. Although UK SPF is perhaps the key driver for that right now, there are many other territories and areas in which that can be a winning combination and a winning partnership. It's not just about UK SPF, but I think that will drive our channels together, perhaps in a way that we've never really achieved before. So we are hugely hopeful at Communities at Work, and um, I'm, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Councillor Kevin Bentley. Um, oh, I, I should say before that, um, and forgive me, Kevin, I've slightly forgotten one thing. Um, as you're speaking, Kevin, we're going to have a poll. Um, so uh, I'd like to ask my um, technical leads to launch that poll on Slido, please. Um, as a delegate, don't feel you've got to answer this right away. You've got a good 15, 20 minutes to think about this question and perhaps think about what you're hearing through our keynote with Councillor Bentley. But please do um, take a vote before the end of the session, before uh, Kevin stops speaking. And we'll see uh, where we get to uh, in terms of your views on that. Um, so over to uh, Kevin. In terms of very brief intro, it's lovely to see you again, Kevin. I know that we've uh, met before and indeed you supported um, the launch event for communities that work for our own prospectus on social housing and UK SPF. So thank you for uh, coming back into the, the round and joining this bigger um, event. Um, many people will know uh, Councillor Kevin Bentley, who's elected to Essex County Council in 2009. He's the leader there and also the chair of the People and Places Board at LGA. So nothing more relevant than that for this morning. Um, uh, Kevin's held a range of political roles, um, has stood for Parliament twice for Colchester, outside of politics, is chair of an award-winning PR agency called Mosaic Publicity, um, and is a journalist by profession. So has that really keen eye um, and perhaps a, a step back view. 
he worked for 20 years at the BBC um, in radio, television, reporting and producing. So, uh, you know, uh, no, no big expectations there, Kevin, but, you know, I'm sure you'll deliver a fantastic presentation for us with that background and that experience. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from you on how you see levelling up, how you see the role of local authorities. And, um, and I'll, come, I'll obviously stay here and then we'll come back to you and see how the poll has fared by the end of your keynote. So thank you, Kevin. Uh, well, Lindsay, thank you very much indeed, and Stephen as well, thank you. And uh, what a build-up, I have to say, cracky. I was making notes, I'd forgotten I'd done most of those things, so it was great to, to hear remind myself. Can I say what a great pleasure it is to be here uh, and supporting this, and for you to invite me as well. And the number of people is phenomenal. I'm just thinking, if we were doing this in person, where would we go? It sounds like Westminster Hall would have to be in. So uh, there is, the, the new technology has led to greater involvement of people, I think that's great, without having to travel as well, which is also very good. So I'm really delighted to be here and, and, and the great work that you do uh, in communities that work uh, and, and the other uh, organisations re represented here today, it's phenomenal. When I uh, was involved, and I am involved in the LGA uh, and the position of the Chair of the People and Places Board came up, I specifically asked to do it. It's something I'm particularly passionate about and all the board members who sit on there, all the politicians, hugely passionate about it as well, as are our officers. We have a, a, a phenomenal uh, group of officers at the LGA covering a variety of work, but particularly in my particular area, who are just fantastic and, and ensure we have all the right information and the people we need to speak to when we do uh, to make sure that we can progress the work of local government in this very important arena. Well, one of the jobs I, I also had at the LGA, which I just want to reference here because it become a little bit more apparent while I'm speaking as well, is after we had the Brexit vote, the LGA were invited to attend with government ministers, sit around the table to discuss the future of the UK and particularly in local government. And I was very honoured and privileged to chair the Brexit task force. It, it was an all-party group, and it wasn't about whether Brexit was good or bad. That kind of ship had sailed. This was about uh, what we should do for local government and what local government, what part we could play, but also what we could also benefit from on behalf of our residents. It wasn't just England. That was our colleagues in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales as well. And we attended regular meetings with government ministers. And I have to say it was it was good. Uh, the then Secretary of State, uh, at, uh, uh, which had various names since, isn't it? But what is it, Dulac? Uh, the Secretary of State was very good at getting other cabinet colleagues and ministers to come and talk to us on a whole variety of issues where local government is directly involved. And actually, local government is directly involved in virtually everything that happens in this country, uh, except some of the national issues, but a lot of the other issues we're directly involved in. And as a result of that, we managed to get lots of uh, things out of the government in terms of uh, the way we could run things, a bit of extra financing. Some of those things were hidden, you could see them, but they definitely happened. Uh, and again, the great officer cadre we had at the LGA were just superb in playing that part. And it, it became very obvious that the national government understood that local government plays a critical role in the running of this country. And I was always clear with ministers, we're not here because you tell us to be here and we don't do what you say. We run the country on behalf of the public with you, okay? Not for you, but with you. Uh, and that was a very powerful message. And I was very clear with every minister that came in front of us that they could not uh, uh, organise around this country and their local government was a major partner in that. Now, having said that, uh, we have lots of partnerships in local government. These are just some you're seeing today uh, where we in turn run our own areas with great help from partners, both in the, the private sector and the public sector as well. Hugely important. Uh, and, and that's why I think this levelling up white paper, I personally think is a great opportunity. It doesn't give us all the answers we want. I guess you'll never probably get to that place, but it's a really good start. For the first time, I think there's true recognition of the partnership that local government will play and all the ancillary uh, partners we have on, on top of that I've just mentioned, how we run the areas of the United Kingdom. And I want to specifically talk about England because that's the bit I'm responsible for at the LGA. We've got excellent colleagues in the other three nations that will talk about that, but I'll specifically talk about England. But nonetheless, a lot of things I'm talking about will be represented by uh, the other three nations as well, and they will certainly recognise uh, a lot of the ongoing issues. So the levelling up white paper, I think very clearly gave an indication that now local government uh, has the opportunity to prove all the things it said it can do to actually now start delivering, and there will be money for that. I have always personally believed that we cannot run everything centrally from Whitehall. And if we were going to do Brexit, I was very clear, we're not swapping Brussels for Whitehall. This was now the opportunity to make sure devolution properly worked. If anyone's known me long enough, and prepared to sit still long enough, will know that I have a very great passion about skills. 
Uh, and I really don't believe that one size fits all. There's certainly some core principles which we need to all adhere to, but each area of the United Kingdom or England have different requirements. Uh, and I think that's hugely important that local government, working with our educational colleagues as well, and housing colleagues as well, and the private sector should determine what happens there. Because if we, if we truly believe that everyone is equal in this country, which I do, and I know probably everyone on this call certainly does, and certainly beyond that, then you must empower people to have the ability to have a good job and a decent place to live. That's, they are the core principles of what we are doing. And if we believe that, I don't think you can do all, all from Whitehall. And there'll be different scenarios in different parts of the country where we can make that better. Different skills required. And as we emerge out of now COVID, uh, there's a whole set of new sector jobs coming up, uh, particularly in the environment and the green sector. Huge opportunities here. We do have a government that's really committed to all of this as well. So therefore, there's an opportunity to skill people in that area. Now, a lot of this is emerging. So we do rely on a lot of the private sector and also through our universities and our colleges as well. Just not think about the kind of jobs that would be, be required. And when we first started on this route, we didn't necessarily know what they will be. They're now starting to really emerge. And we know we can be market leaders, not just in the country, but across in the rest of Europe and the rest of the world as well. So we're very keen at the LGA to, to do that and help promote that. And the green agenda around skills is a major part of work that we have been doing and will continue to do as well. Uh, housing, so critically important that everyone should have a decent home to live in. And of course, it's the kind of homes we're now building that become very, very important. Local authorities, which do have the ability to build homes, we want to encourage that. That is so important that we have a proper affordable housing, a proper affordable rentable housing as well. That's hugely important. I know lots of local government and lots of local councils are moving that way forward. Certainly in Essex, we're doing that. In our particular case, being a, a county authority, uh, we'll be we'll build, building homes particularly for people with learning difficulties, uh, because we know that to retrofit that later is not good for the individual, not good for the property. So we build houses now that they will have for the rest of their lives, which is hugely important that we do that. And, and in a very crude way, you'll save money in the long run by doing that. Money is not the driver here. People are the driver here. But nonetheless, it is something we have to consider. But by doing that, you know, 10 years ago, we wouldn't even consider doing that. Now we can. We want more freedoms to be able to do that, to take control of the local areas that we run. I passionately believe uh, that as local councillors, I'm a local councillor too, I am much closer to the electorate than most other elected people uh, and all my colleagues around the country in the same position. We live amongst the communities that elect us. They know where we live. They literally knock on our doors. They literally knock on my door quite often. And that's good. I don't mind that. That's good. They telephone us. They sometimes want to chat, sometimes want to complain, sometimes want to ask for advice, but they have that connectivity You can do that. And that's what I think the government is now recognising in the white paper. I hope so anyway, and if they don't, I certainly will be at the front of the queue waving the flag to promote that to them as well, that we are so close to our constituents and we hear what they've got to say. I, I'm one of those leaders that in Essex, we have a, a very strong climate change agenda. I do come into County Hall in Chelmsford. I live in, a, uh, in Colchester, a place called Mersey Island. I catch the bus in, and I travel on the train and I walk into County Hall. Now, not only is that good for the environment, but I sit amongst the very people that I represent on the bus and on the train and walking in the cafes and that sort of thing. And I listen to what they've got to say and they will talk to me and they will, or I will listen to what they've got to say or they will want to talk to me about certain issues. Real connectivity. So, you know, we don't believe in any bubble, any shape or form in a local government. We're here amongst the people. And that is what's so powerful and important. That's what led us in Essex uh, and led me when I first became leader back in May last year, was to make sure we promoted our agenda, everyone's Essex, that no one is left behind. And I use a phrase continually here in Essex, and I use it in the LGA as well, which is something my mother, my late mother taught me many years ago when I was a small boy. And that is that everyone should have the opportunity to reach for the stars. Whether you touch those stars isn't the most important thing. The most important thing is the opportunity and the ability to reach for those stars. And giving people the ability and the knowledge and the confidence to be able to do that. And of course, I, I would say this is, this is not a race. It's rather like a, uh, and it's not one size fits all. It, it is like if you have one of those long distance races, the starting lines are different places for people. The finish line is the same place, but the starting position is different. And for some people, just getting up and getting dressed in the morning 
is the most important thing for them. So we must make sure we work with them. And we do. We've got very excellent, superb social worker people out there who do so much to help people, which is hugely important. For others, it's academic achievement. So everyone is treated equally according to their abilities and their needs. And that's very much embedded in the work we do at the LGA and in our local councils as well. And then it's lifelong learning. So uh, we hear a lot about uh, young people post-16, uh, um, uh, post-18, that's been discussed very shortly with universities, isn't it? And, and I think uh, that's hugely important because the start in life is so very important for people, but actually all through life is important as well. Uh, I happen to believe that no one has ever fully trained anything. You constantly need training, you constantly need learning, and we should be there as local government to support that. So for us, and especially coming out of the pandemic, when people are changing careers or looking for new jobs or their old job may not exist anymore, that what we're doing here, and I'm sure it's happening across the country as well, certainly I know the LGA are promoting a lot of this work, is people in their 30s, 40s and 50s and 60s also need to be caught up in that learning experience, the chance to learn new skills or enhance their existing skills as well. So we run across the country adult community learning which is a phenomenally good thing, and certainly for health and well-being, has proved once again to be invaluable. But actually, let's do more with it. Let's work with our further education colleges. Let's have more of those qualification skills and courses for people that they have the confidence in later years that they can carry on into a new career or enhance their current career and learn new skills for the jobs that are emerging as well. You know, if you're 50 and 60, you're still working in this country probably, and you need those skills, as importantly, as younger people who are coming into the marketplace who want to learn new skills, get new qualifications. That's hugely important. So lifelong learning is very important in what we're doing. So the Leveling Up White Paper, I think, gives us the opportunity now to strike out to government and say, we know we can do this. We're going to prove we can do this. I don't always need money from you. What I need you is to actually get out of my way and let me do it and support me in what I'm doing as well. That's the message clearly we need to to give to government and I think we have a Secretary of State that is listening to that as well. We'll see whether we get all those freedoms as I like to call them but we certainly have those missions that are set out quite clearly in the white paper and now it's our chance to prove the case. I think uh, the ball has been handed to us now to prove that we can do that. We've said it for a long time, we know we can do it, now we need to make the case to do it and then hold the government to account to actually deliver on that. One final word on the UK Prosperity Fund. Uh, now I mentioned about the Brexit work we did. One of the big areas we talked around is what this meant, that when we left the European Union and we knew we weren't paying the, the money into it, what was going to happen to that? So very clearly, having been involved myself as a local councillor for many years in the structural funds, the European structural funds, and knowing just how important they are, not just to local government, but to many organisations out there. We couldn't just switch the tap off. Now, we negotiated uh, as part of the LGA to the extension that went on with those. It wasn't a clean break the minute we left the, the EU because that had been disastrous for people. But we needed something to fill that uh, gap financially for people going forward. And without too much of a hiatus. Now, we do know the government has announced alongside the white paper the money going in for the next uh, two or three years uh, for the UK Prosperity Fund. I happen to agree, I think that we shouldn't be leaving uh, the, the money that's allocated to uh, skills uh, for too long. Uh, I think that's, as I've just said, one of the most important things. You need a skilled nation of all ages and all abilities to be able to promote UK PLC as well as for individual lives as well. And that's something we will pick up with, uh, with the government, that people and skills are important, but do we really have to wait that period of time for that to happen? We can actually get on with this now. It's part of our making the case, if you like. But I'm pleased we have this at last. Um, as I said, it's very important we're working with partners. This isn't just devolving. When I say we're not, we want to not swap Brussels to Whitehall, we don't want to swap it for County Hall and Town Hall either. It's about place. I'm a huge believer in place. I spent virtually all of my political career in the place environment, and I know just how important it is. I know when communities and organisations come together, that's a powerful force for good and what can be achieved. What we need now is to be left alone to be able to do that. Yes, we do need the finance. I'm not suggesting we don't. I'm suggesting it's not probably the first question. This is maybe two or three questions later. The first question, the first thing we need to prove is we can do this, we can do it together. And there are lots of very, very skilled people who are not elected councillors, who are not officers and local authorities, who are in organisations who can assist us in doing that. This now, I think, is a real opportunity. Post-COVID, as tragic as that was, it was tragic for lots of people. But it has now given us the opportunity to think how we now do things, how we run this country, how we skill people in this country as well. The white paper 
how we govern this country is hugely important and how we work with our partners becomes hugely important. And because of all of that, if we get this right together, and I think we can, we can really set the agenda for the next 40, 50, 60 years hence for people yet to be born. And I have a great view of life that uh, there's no limit to what anyone can achieve, providing they don't mind who takes the credit. That's how I run the Essex County Council. That's how I run my part of the LGA as well. It's not about me, it's about people and to help people who will never know who we are. Lindsay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, very wide ranging and really interesting keynote. Thank you. I think you've set the scene perfectly for the way in which local authorities can seek partnerships all of that background, um, the, the long road um, from post-Brexit to where we are now and the new opportunities to set that course. Um, I'm also really heartened to hear um, that you uh, also feel that the people and skills element, um, skills especially, um, must come through that the UK Shared Prosperity Fund as soon as possible. We also share that view. So I was pleased to hear that. Um, uh, we've got a few moments for questions. So if that's all right, Kevin, I'll put, I'll put a few to you um, and then we'll go to the results of the poll um, before uh, before moving on. Um, so there, there's a, a couple of questions around the levelling up white paper. Um, and so I'll take those both together and, and see, see how you reflect on them. One is um, perhaps the, the real positive, and I think you've touched on this before, but what's the most positive thing you think you've seen in the levelling up white paper that you may not have seen before? Um, and converse to that, do you think there's anything missing in the levelling up white paper that you would wish to have seen? So two very good points. I think probably I, I may have touched on uh, the good things. I think now is the real chance for local government and its partners to really show and make the case. We know we can do this. We've never really been given the opportunity. I don't think it's such a formal way before. That's not to say it hasn't happened, but in a, in a formal way before, this white paper gives that opportunity. And also importantly, that every part of England, in this particular case, but I think this applies to the United Kingdom as well, um, is equal in this. It is hugely important that you, you will get all this, you know, north-south divide. I mean, I think now is the opportunity to say, actually, every part of our country is important and every part of our country has a part to play. And you just let us get on and do that is the positive thing, I would say. And I think the paper certainly points in that direction. Uh, for me, perhaps it's about, uh, now I'm not really necessarily want to get into structures, but on devolution, I think it probably, and there may be lots of reasons for it, but it probably didn't go quite as far as I'd like it to go to explain how we can govern in a structural way the country better. Uh, so for me, I've always, I've always clearly said that, you know, local government works very well, but it was set up in this way back in 74. Can we look at it and make it slightly better, more efficient, much more smoother for people to deal with? I make no comment on what it should look like. I'm saying uh, I think I've had a lot like a bit more discussion around that and how we can achieve that better. So uh, I wouldn't say it was a disappointment. It was more just I think we could have gone a bit further. But I understand also you can't change the world with one white paper and overnight. So this for me gives us a very clear way forward. And I think now it's an invitation by government for us in local government, not only to put our case forward, but start to shape the future of local government as well. Thank you, uh, Kevin. That's really helpful to think through. And, and indeed, um, Michael Gove, a Secretary of State at DLUC at the moment, is um, has been driven on devolution for many decades. And it will be interesting to see how far he can take that and, and in what time frame. Um, OK, thank you. A, a couple more questions, if I may. Um, there's, uh, you mentioned freedoms and powers for, for local authorities uh, and not wishing to replace Brussels with Whitehall. Um, there's a particular question around um, devolution and those powers and freedoms. Um, is there anything that you would like to see further um, extended as a, as a power to local authorities? The uh, example given is 16 to 18 education funding, for example. Of course, that yeah, plays into yeah. the skills uh, element that you raised. That may not be the only area, but do you have any comments or, or uh, thoughts on that? Uh, well, I'll certainly start on that because it's something, as I told you, I've, 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 I've campaigned on in my own little way for many years. And well, I said, if people sit still long enough, I'll give them the whole nine yards on it because I, I passionately believe that this is what we need to be doing on a much more local basis. So, uh, and I call them freedoms. I mean, power is the correct term, but of course it, it 
comes up all sorts of images. So freedoms, we want freedom to do this, be able to achieve. And why do we want it? Not for us, we want it for every resident. That's the most important thing. All of our citizens must benefit from what we're trying to do here. So therefore, I think rather than having a, a funding agency that sits centrally and funds centrally, that should be put out to local areas. Now, whether they are counties or unities or districts, or as we were talking about in the white paper, uh, the economic areas, whatever that may be, but what needs to happen as a structure is for local government to sit with educationists from primary to university, right the way, the, the broad spectrum and lifelong learning ACL, and also employers as well, and also students as well, to sit and determine what is required. And it will be different. There are core principles, as I said, but it will be different across different parts of the country. If you're in the Midlands or in the East Coast or the West Coast or the South or the North, it will be different. And therefore the different skills are required. And the local people, not just local councils, the local people know the answers to those questions. And they can set their own skills agenda and maybe even set their own examinations required for that particular job. But it must be done in consultation with younger people coming into the work market as well, and very much with our educationists and very much with businesses. I think local government's role in that is one of convening. So we have the, the, great, the great authority we have is to convene people together, don't we? And we should use that to the full to get the, the people who actually deliver this and benefit from it together talking. That's what I'd like to see. Now, there's nothing in the white paper that stops us doing that. And certainly in Essex, we have a skills and employability board. What we don't have is the freedom with the money. And let's be honest, any freedom is great, but money is the main thing that makes it happen. So we need that to be devolved and not just done centrally, because I think then we could fund our colleges in a far better way than they're done at the moment. Fantastic. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bentley. I really appreciate that. And I, I couldn't agree more with your role in, in convening. And um, uh, I think I would end on a, a, a consideration for LGA and all local authorities to, to come convene with us a, a little more and, and work with all of the social housing sector as well as communities that work and our members. And, and I hope that we can do that as we go forward um, in UK SPF and, and wider levelling up considerations. So, OK, that um, concludes the questions. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Councillor Bentley, for joining us this morning. Of course, you're welcome to stay on for the next session, but we appreciate you may also have a county to run and things to get on and do. But you're very welcome to, to uh, sit back and, um, and watch the next session. Um, so huge thank you to you. And I hope we meet again uh, soon. Um, and uh, I'll move on to an introduction to our uh, next uh, session and the chair of that session.